backpack, a piece of steel in one hand and a can of mace in the other. <laughs> and, uh, and guys were trying to sell me joints everywhere. And then uh, some black guy turned me on to the bus station. So I found the bus station and uh, there'll be a song all about the bus station on our EP called One in a Million. And, uh, and then I, I rode all around Fullerton thinking it was just as small as the city I had seen and I would find Izzy. I rode the bus for like two days. <laughs> Never found Izzy. But, you know, it, it, I stayed in Huntington Beach for a while. I found this empty apartment with a door open and a skateboard in the corner, and that was Izzy's. Huh. Got lucky. I paid some guys a case of beer to help me, help me find um, Huntington Beach. So I didn't know where it was. And then, um, then I hitchhiked the whole country for a while, looking for where I wanted to stay and start working on a band. You know, went all the way up to went to San Francisco, went to Rhode Island, went down to Hollywood, Florida, back to Indiana for a while to regroup my brain, and then uh, back to L.A. and I moved to Hollywood. Um, yeah, it's like I got the tattoo first. I had a, a friend design it because I just felt that no matter what happens with this band, where it went, what we sold or it broke up, changed, whatever, or any other members, that at that time, it was the most important thing. And it's like, I like tattoos and I wanted something that would always remind me of what was once there, you know, a symbol of it. And so, you know, I got this, the cross tattoo here. And then um, Geffen liked it so much, we decided to use it for a cover. Uh, it'd be one of those things that I tell your grandkids. See, like Slash, you know, like notice, see Slash wanted straight hair, so we gave him straight hair. <laughs> I didn't ask for straight yes, hair. Yes, you did. Right? You totally no, did. Didn't. Yes, you did. I never said that. Yes, you did. Totally. How? What makes you say that? Because you did. Why? Was I drunk? I, I don't know. I have, yeah, I think you were. You were. You were at the Hell House. Oh yeah, because I told Bill. I told Bill. I said you're never gonna be able to draw curly hair right. <laughs> Dynamics is, is, it's physical, you know? I mean, it's, it's definitely an emotional and physical thing. That's where it comes from. It's like, you know, you get to one part and then you want to, you know. I can't put it into words, really, how, what it is. It's just Slash a feeling. Is, uh, one of the most emotional guitar players that I've ever met or ever seen. And coming from Indiana, I used to play with this guitar player named Paul. And I learned about blues and emotionalism and stuff through him, and he was a big Page fanatic. And then I came to L.A., and I saw all these people trying to be Eddie Van Halen. And it took five years to find somebody who played more from the heart rather than just trying to be the fastest and trying to do this and that to be a big rock star. Someone who, like, he'll be very quiet and stuff most of the time and really won't let a lot of himself out until he picks up a guitar and then his heart and soul seems to pour out through the guitar and it's just like I sit down a lot of times at shows I'll sit down right on the stage right in front of his amp when he's doing a solo because it just it means so much to me just to hear that Like for a couple of years, Izzy was real good at like, he'd been out there just long enough and he was always good at scamming his way in and I wasn't. So it took me like about two years to even like be able to talk to people. I just kind of like stand around and watch, you know, and people didn't accept you so easily. And I remember I was like, I was wearing cowboy boots and I got told I looked like I just got off the boat. And now, and now like people buy cowboy boots for their mother out there. <laughs> it's like, it's kind of weird. Um, but, you know, we met Slash. We ran an ad for a heavy metal punk glam guitarist. <laughs> Blues influenced. <laughs> and Slash showed up and we said, nah. But he kept popping up everywhere we were at and all of a sudden we started working together. Um, 
it, it just it, it took a long time but I mean I guess it took a long time for me to learn and accept things out there you know he had been there the whole time and nothing was really that new from the beginning <laughs> yeah and Izzy was just running around learning about every fad that there was so finally at this point he's just bored with everything except you know and just like just gets into his guitar and it's real cool he's like you know, that doesn't worry about too much of anything. It's really, guitar. it's really funny because like none of us are from Los Angeles, and everybody like tries to label us an LA band. We just all happen to have met there, and we were the only five guys that could have made up Guns N' Roses. I mean, we had different combinations of us in different bands, you know, throughout the time we were coming up and getting it together. And yeah, there was like one or two of the same yeah. guys. We couldn't, there was nobody else in L.A. we could have played with, so it was inevitable that the five of us would get together because that was it. I mean, there was no other combinations that were going to work, you know. I heard a Paul McCartney interview and he was talking about how you write songs and he said that there really, there is no formula. He said he's written songs probably every single way, you know, imaginable. and. You know, he, he was wondering if there was a few more ways. Um, sometimes it starts out with one word, sometimes one note, sometimes a verse, a riff, a chorus, a drum beat. It always varies every time. Sometimes a whole song hits you at once. Then you're very fortunate, I think. And you know, you've really got something. Other times it takes, you know, it could take up to a year to get a song exactly the way that your mind's picturing it. A lot of times you, you hear something in your head, you picture it, but you can't quite figure out how to get it out. Like if you, if you were a painter and you see the picture, but you can't figure out how to paint it. I've heard a lot of painters describe it as basically their work is just a shadow of what they saw in their head. You know, and sometimes that's what we get. Other times we nail it right on the head and it completely comes out. When we start a song, it's like I'll try it in different ways and finding which way fits it best. And if if I think that some sound, some way of singing is going to work better, I'll just work on that way. It might be something new that I've never done before. Um, like, it's so easy, I'd never sang a song like that before, but the high voice just didn't seem to fit it as well. And so I started working on the low one. And Mr. Brownstone, um, it reminded me of a Stones-ish type funk thing. And so I was just playing around with it and then you know, we heard a rehearsal tape back and it, it sounded like it might work, so I just started practicing that way. Um, I just, I'm like a second baritone and, and I just worked on widening my range to get a high range. And so then I just try to find a way to use it, to use the whole thing rather than limit myself. song my michelle right and his um axel comes to me with these lyrics one day and i got oh axel you really can't say that i mean we've known this girl for years He's, and it's well, the well, truth he's about 13 and i went out with her then later on and we got into a little hassle or whatever and then i wrote this song but and it was basically the truth and it says some nice stuff about you know how at the end <laughs> no in the, in the middle of it you know everyone needs love and you know that it's true and stuff but I like to describe, sometimes like, you won't touch a subject because you don't want to expose it, it might hurt someone. But then, if the subject's really that interesting, you just rip it apart and expose it. And that's what we did. And basically though, it worked out good for everybody in the long run. She's happy about the song, and her dad even liked the fact that it was really accurate, so. <laughs> it was funny at the time though. It's like, no, you can't. Yeah, at the time it was really, that. it took three weeks for me to like, finally go, um, what do you think of these lyrics? <laughs> but she was really happy that I wrote it, so. She's, now she's like popular. It's a really cold business. I mean, it's like, you know, you can be on top and, and popular and everybody loves you and you're making lots of money and then it's gone at some point too. And then, you know, 
it's like we're lucky because we have people that we work with that we're close to and we can you know really be personal with and feel like someone's you know actually loves us and whatever and it's like I wouldn't it, go that far but if it falls apart tomorrow you know what I mean you, your history no one gives a about you anymore and you know you, what, but you, you go back and get oh, a, I'll be your friend I'll yeah. still be your friend you're gonna yeah. go back and get a secretary when will job I talk to you once a year yeah. go back home to your parents what I mean, it's like it's hard in that way, but it's worth it. <laughs> this is great, yeah. You know? well, we got hired to be the bad boys, and we were the bad boys. And now all of a sudden, we have to be <laughs> businessmen and you can only to borrow and good and stuff like that. You can only be bad boys during non-working hours. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm psychotic, and that's a real problem to try to like, you know. Okay, well. Okay, now I'm done with business, now I can go in this room and be psychotic and tear it up. You know, it's like I have to like balance out, yeah. you know, when can I destroy everything around me to when I have to be nice to everybody. Yeah, things aren't that cut and dry, so it's, it's hard to... <laughs> People don't really understand Brownstone. Um, we have countless friends that were very, very close friends. The girl that the song Rocket Queen was written about. Her life is history. I mean, she's alive. There's not much left to it. Um, my, my we have countless other friends that have spent, you know, upwards to like 50 grand on rehabilitation. They can't get away from drugs. Um, it's a very sad thing, you know. We can't even hang out with these people because, you know, you go to say hi, and next thing you know, the conversation turns to drugs, and you go, well, I got to go take care of business because you don't want to be involved with it. And it, it's kind of sad because, you know, we grew up with some of these people, or at least me in L.A. for, I was out there for seven years, last seven years, you know, and I've, you know, lost at least five or six people that I hung out with every day. Yeah. Um, so Brownstone is just about, um, a, just about having a battle with it and, you know, and wishing you never touched the stuff and trying to get away from it. to take vacation and destroying everything around me because I can't calm down. I don't know. I'm it's a just, wreck when we're off the road. I don't know what to do with myself. Like you hear about like Joe Walsh destroying hotel rooms or whatever. I just destroyed my apartment and then rebuild it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not necessarily fun, but it happens. <laughs> but you find yourself in a situation where like, you know, we were all pretty much troublesome kids. And, and now, a lot of the things that you used to do as a kid for fun that you might have got away with, you're not going to get away with now. Um, and also, they might be stupid things. So, I don't know, it just escalates into a point where, you know, it's like throwing a TV out of a window, out of a window is boring. Let's see if we can drive a car off the roof, you know, <laughs> put a brick on the pedal. strict upbringing I wasn't allowed to listen to music um, except for old Elvis Presley and um, Jimmy Swagger gospel records <laughs> the coolest I thing I mean this Jimmy Swagger thing that's gone on in the last few things is like uh, no big surprise uh, because I was raised on Jimmy Swagger religious tapes from when I was five we had a reel to reel deck and we bought them all um, this just went on you know for years and years and years and then finally I was, you know, accused of doing drugs and drinking and all this stuff that I wasn't doing, and I was kicked out of my house for um, not cutting my hair, and it was above my ears at the time, <laughs> and I was 16, and, you know, and at that point, I just said, well, if I'm going to be accused of all these things, I might as well find out what they're all about, and, you know, and so I just... You know, maybe I got on the wrong track, but I seem to have pulled it together somewhat on my own. And it took a long time, and, it, and it's still, even to this day, I still have to deal with, 
you know, coming to grips with certain things that happened during my childhood and certain things I wasn't allowed to do and allowed to hear and everything like that. So I'm still exploring every field of music I possibly can. You know, I feel like I got a lot of catching up to do. A lot of energy, you know, I mean, we're just like five kids. And, and basically, you know, all the work and stuff that goes into what we do is generated by these five guys. And now there's a whole, I don't, you know, countless people that are involved in what we're doing. And we, like, are sort of the bottom line on a lot of people's careers at this point. You know what I mean? It's like some people, we're the only band that they work with, you know? A sort of strange responsibility. But then if you're too much of a pain, you know, they can find someplace else yeah, to go. They can still get another job. You know, they can put, I worked with Guns N' Roses on their, uh, what do you call it? You know, those sheets that you fill out. The, with the black list, the red list, whatever. <laughs> oh, you, you, you survived that? Guys, you'll never work in this industry again. <laughs> getting to be more exciting thinking about it all the time I don't know what it's going to do in terms of sales or our following but it should be for us a very weird experimental process and coming up with a lot of new things because Appetite for Destruction a lot of the material written on that was done while we were in the club scene in LA that's over two years ago you know sometimes three years ago some of it and Anything Goes was first started about four years ago. And so during this time, we've had a lot of time to grow and mature, I think, lyrically and musically. And the next record, we get to like fuse this all together it's, and see what we come yeah, up with. It's a strange thing because we, we're we gonna, you know, actually, it's, it's different because we've had a long time, like you said, about, you know, growing and stuff as musicians and as just as people and, and experiences and things. And I think, when the tour is done, you know, and it's time to sit down and just put music together for the next record, it's going to be a completely different situation. It's not like we had years to put a song together or whatever, you know, things change over, you know, course of years. Me and Axel met at a certain point in our relationship, you know, with me and him and, you know, us and the rest of the band and stuff has changed. And it's like we're going to sit down and start writing songs, like right off. I just, it's hard to explain. It's going to be like, sitting down and just putting all this years of experience down you know and trying to write however many songs we're going to do and i don't know just put it in a certain time frame yeah, <laughs> just like a lot of material all done. it's like a lot of people right now are getting turned on to appetite for destruction like it's brand new and yeah. we still have the same momentum behind those songs as we've always had and we still find something in them and we get excited but you know the next record for us will be like a, anywhere from a two to a four year jump and a lot of people you know are going to get that jump in one year's time and it's, I think it's going to surprise a lot of people solos and stuff like you know my own like one place where I get to do guitar solo and stuff. It's um, never anything that I made up or, on the, you know, like before the show or a couple days ago. It's always just like made up on the spot, you know? There's a lot of improv. And like I'll go skateboarding behind Slash and he doesn't know it and that's a lot of fun. <laughs> or I like to go out in the crowd sometimes like while he's playing. And, and mess with it. Yeah, I, I ran out into the crowd the other night and went, I'm wireless now, so it's a new thing. So I go running up into like where the monitor board is and all these people are going, oh my God, where's he going? And the security, and the security guys chasing him, there's kids chasing him and he's running full speed. Meanwhile, they got little low steps and I almost fell. It was, yeah, I did, I hit some steps. I was like, oh God, I didn't even know they were there. <laughs> Live playing is 50% of what we are about as far as a band, maybe even more than that. I mean, you record, I, I'm more, even one of those people that enjoys recording, you know, even though we've only done it seriously once, I mean, I like to put everything into it. And then to go out and play it live is, you know, the other half of the, 
the other side of the coin, you know. It's great. I mean, it's the best. Playing in front of a crowd that's, you know, really enthusiastic is one of the best feelings you can ever have, you know. It's the most fun. It's just great. We like playing our, our songs. Um, also, it's like, you know, we give the, I give the light people and everybody a hard time because I don't like to follow the set list because I like to go off the feel of the band and the feel of the crowd. And like, what I think the band's gonna be able to play the best and go for the best vibe with the crowd. You know, so it, it makes every, every show just a little bit different. And we never know how we're gonna end the show. <laughs> I mean, we never know if we're gonna do an encore or we're gonna play for a long period of time or if as the case happens a lot of times if I'm gonna get like pissed off and leave <laughs> because something always happens at the end of a show for me for some reason I don't know why it's like the last song something happens you can see on the on the on the live MTV thing it's like you know everything was pro except this mantra man that didn't have a clue of what was going on and I the crowd's hearing the show everything's great we're hearing spaceships land on stage, <laughs> backwards echoes, I know, it's like, what's screaming that? What's feedback, that? you know, the drummer doesn't know what, Steven doesn't know what's going on, you know. Finally, I tried to nail the, I tried to nail the monitor man with my microphone, and my tour manager moved, and I nailed him. <laughs> so, but you can, you know, that was messy. Yeah. But it, it leaves for some excitement. People never know what's going to happen, you know, because, and they never know if, if I don't come back, it's like, that's a low deed, <laughs> or, or what happened. <laughs> yeah, it's Slash, this is Axel, from Guns N' Roses. And um, what you're about to see is, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> didn't, we, were, Man, we, didn't we didn't know. It. We didn't know, okay? It was supposed to be a There was cameras, joke. all kinds of things happening. It was an accident. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>